Okay, good, uh, good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to our, our presentation today, led first by Dr. Ashrith Guha, who completed his residency at UT Houston, followed by cardiology and advanced heart failure fellowship in Iowa, and he's been integral to really our success uh, as a heart failure program, and will be taking the lead to present shock. That'll be followed by Dr. Arvind Bemaraj, who completed his uh, residency training at Drexel University in Philadelphia, followed by cardiology at Cook County and advanced heart failure fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic. And he too has been uh, integral to our, our, our team success related to VAD and transplant advanced heart failure. So the two of them collectively will guide us in our presentation and we'll introduce our panel. Kuha. So good morning, everyone. Uh, so uh, the way we will uh, do this is we have a couple of cases which uh, uh, we'll go over and uh, mainly pick our esteemed pa panelists here. So just to introduce our panels, we have on the far left, Dr. Colin Barker, who's our senior interventional uh, cardiologist uh, with uh, MDCA group, and then Dr. Faisal Masood, who's the director of uh, uh, all the critical care units here in at Methodist, and uh, Dr. Eddie Suarez, who is uh, one of our VAD transplant surgeons and also uh, the director of lung transplant, and then Jerry Estep, who is uh, our medical director of uh, VAD and transplant, and uh, uh, now going to be the chief of heart failure at Cleveland Clinic. So, uh, so we'll go, get started. So uh, quickly, I'll just go over a few. Um, uh, things to begin with. We'll define the spectrum of cardiogenic shock, talk a little bit about choice of support, and then go over the patient cases. So in terms of you know defining cardiogenic shock, you really have to look at three profiles. One is the pre-cardiogenic shock, where you have hypoperfusion without hypotension. So even though cardiogenic shock for the, you know, the one in the center is what we all uh, always worry about, which is defined as hypotension with hypoperfusion, where systolic blood pressure is under 90 or your mean arterial blood pressure uh, less than 30 millimeters compared to the baseline, what really you know, starts off or what we really have to be looking at is pre-cardiogenic shock where you have hypoperfusion without hypotension, where patients have cool extremities, they have uh, uh, evidence of end organ dysfunction, where you do have, you know, hemodynamically they have their uh, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure greater than 15 and their cardiac index under 2. Now this progresses with time into cardiogenic shock and then you have another entity called severe refractory cardiogenic shock which is hypotension with hypoperfusion despite support. So these are patients who are failing inotropic support or mechanical circulatory support despite um, you know, in all the support and then the con uh, consistently being hypotensive. So what are the etiologies of cardiogenic shock? You know, there are multiple ones. The two big categories are non-MI related or non-ACS related cardiogenic shock and ACS related cardiogenic shock. I think these, this distinction is very important, mainly because the presentation is very different and the reserve that the patients have when they're presenting with shock is very different. Hence the choice of support in these uh, patients uh, are also different. And as we go through the cases here, I think uh, that will become a little more obvious. And in terms of the cardiogenic shock care algorithm, you know, as you go through um, uh, from top to bottom, you know, initially it is resuscitation and medical therapy with inotropes or vasopressors and uh, the other things that you need to address, whether it's mechanical ventilation or etiology-specific medical therapy, which means if you have uh, um, you know, an ACS syndrome, then you have to get PCI or, or cabbage done um, uh, soon. And then if you, uh, despite that, if patients are not doing well, then consider you know, a temporary MCS. Uh, now, if the patients ha do not have uh, ACS, then you're really looking at uh, temporary MCS. Uh, right away. And then, if the sh shock persists and there is no recovery, you're looking at durable VAD, um, whether it's as a destination or a bridge to transplant, or sometimes just using temporary MCS, bridge patients to transplantation. So, uh, again, su some suggested indications for percutaneous short-term devices. 
you know, uh, like we discussed earlier, you know, uh, ACS, whether it's complication of ACS or just ACS itself. And then, um, you know, severe heart failure in the setting of, oh. uh, So the key aspects of, you know, using temporary uh, mechanical circulatory support in uh, use of cardi in, in cardiogenic shock is, one is timing, where you need early initiation of mechanical circulatory support, the level of support, whether you're adequately perfusing all the organs, and then prevention and management of potential device-related complications. So I think with this introduction, we'll just uh, um, get into the case. Um, so I don't know why it's not. So we have a 28-year-old female who started a sport post-heart transplant for uh, one year ago, pres presents really in sort of cardiogenic shock. She has a heart rate of 130, blood pressure of uh, 85 or 50 with a respiratory rate of 22, saturation of 97% on two liters, and a JVP of 20 centimeters, bibacillar crackles. Uh, again, on exam, she has a gallop, cool extremities. So she was taken to the cath lab for a uh, right heart cath and a biopsy shows elevated biventricular uh, filling pressures with an SVO2 of 29, and she's already on dobutamine uh, with three mics per kilo per minute, and she, you know, she has a severe acute rejection on the biopsy, and her echo looks like this. So I guess my question to the uh, you know, to audience and the panelists are, you know, what would you do next? Would you just add another inotrope, vasopressor, go to intra-aortic balloon pump, you know, go to ECMO or temporary mechanical circulatory support. Uh, I guess we'll start with Jerry. Yes, I think the, the case certainly highlights um, potential recovery, right, as a profile. So having had heart transplant and inflammation in the heart and the setting of rejection, uh, the, the similarity would be someone coming in with myocarditis and, and fulminant perhaps uh, uh, shock from that. And you want to be aggressive and for her, I think the highlights are she's in biventricular heart failure. She, inotrope is not sustaining her. So I'm not even thinking more medicines to, to create more wall stress and dysrhythmias. And so for me, and for us, typically as first line, uh, we, because of the ease of placement, we place an intraortic balloon pump. Now having said that, the likelihood for response, this is an evolving, uh, an evolving uh, <laughs> challenge, if you will in that trying to predict who's going to respond versus not. We do it as first line because we can do it at the bedside. We don't have to mobilize at the cath lab. Now you say she's already been to the cath lab. So at the time of one can easily do that. Um, I'm concerned about the severity of right-sided heart failure. And there have been now a few published reports that the, um, the severity of coexisting right-sided heart failure may minimize good favorable response. Um, but for me, just to give you my, my answer, um, I think intraortic balloon pump placement, um, but with the understanding that we're going to be following her in, in increments of, of an hour to two and following her blood pressure, urine output, and her response, because there's a good likelihood here that she may progress and need more. Um, Colin, I, I just wanted to ask you one thing about, uh, you know, use of, uh, what is your opinion on use of Swan-Gans catheters in uh, cardiogenic shock as an interventionalist? Um, I, I'm, I'm a proponent of swans, but can we take a step back? I, pro I probably sure. wouldn't put a balloon in. I mean, I don't think a balloon's going to get you anywhere with this person. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, she's actively dying. You need an exit strategy. She was in the cath lab. Why, why didn't she just get an impeller or ECMO in the cath lab? I mean, that, that would be, I mean, my first approach. A balloon is, is very temporary. I mean, it's, it's minimal support. It's a class three in Europe. You know, I think we got to get away from balloon yeah, pumps. Yeah, so I, I think that's important to highlight because this comes up all the time. In, in Europe, it's a class three in the setting of being studied for uh, MI or PCI high risk indications. There's really no good, there's no data actually in acute on chronic heart failure or the setting of, you know, myocarditis or rejection, let alone rejection uh, or rejection. And so the intraortic balloon pump, I think it is fair. In terms of the list here, it is the least amount of support. Published reports of cardiac output, output augmentation as high as 25%, but some may get a lot less. Um, but instead of failing with ongoing onotropes, I think it's a cleaner level of support. It is the easiest with the lowest risk profile. She's female, she's relatively small. You haven't given us some other important information while we consider 
you know, larger French sheaths to, to provide support. But when you look at the tandem heart, it's a 15 French Canada, right? We're talking about CP, CP versus balloon pump in the only trial, albeit small, really no difference. So, so I don't think we're still there as a community. We've been using balloon pumps in heart failure, and there's some data coming out about its ability to stabilize some patients. And so you never really know until you try, but I do, I do agree that it is a lower level of support. This lady is sick, um, and, and it wouldn't be unreasonable to maybe offer uh, an Impella uh, device. I'd be worried about a 15 French tandem let alone an ECMO circuit, which, which is at the bare minimum, if you use the tandem 15 French to support her, you're talking about a greater than 15 French. And so, so you can maybe give us a little idea about her, her sizing. So she, she's about 5'1", um, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe 200 pounds. It's an issue, but like, I'd probably read what Colin pointed out to as well. The, the, the trials you're talking about, there were there are some issues with that. There are people who are ventilated and who are in pretty severe shock. They're not just the precardiogenic shock uh, people that, that you're talking about when they compare it to the balloon pump versus the impella. So it'll be interesting to see comparisons and, and further trials in the future. Uh, it is much easier to put in a balloon pump, 100% agree. And if someone is there in front of you, you know, uh, needing acute support, that's, I think, a decent first line to pl place in. If, like you said, you were in the cath lab, though, I think an Impella CP is an excellent choice for the, especially a younger patient with, with, uh, with their vascular, we talk about vascular resistance, which is different from someone who's older, has more atherosclerotic disease uh, for bloom pump. Uh, ECMO, I, I'd probably hold off on ECMO unless they have really severe end organ dysfunction. You're trying to save the end organs. It's going to fight against the heart. It's going to make I think yeah, unless you unload the heart, it makes cardi cardiac recovery a little, it may strain the heart a little bit more than either an impeller or, or a balloon pump would. I think, I think that's an important point because if here the concept is recovery. And if you're putting in uh, peripheral ECMO without venting, because you're worried about increasing LVDP as you support the patient with that. I think, pump, uh, Jerry, we, we, we'll challenge. talk about it in Good. a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's not get into the end of the case. So, you know, um, she, she got a, a balloon pump. She's a little more awake. It's we were to improve for a, a few days, but uh, um, oh, well, really not a, a whole a, lot. A few days of balloon pump support? Um, yes, a few days of balloon pump support. You know, because her maps improved, she started to make a little more urine, but she was still not out of, uh, you know, shock per se, in the sense that she still had some... Um, end organ dysfunction, creatinine did not normalize, and we used this time to actually give her a thymoglobulin, you know, and, and augmentation of immunosuppression to see if she would reverse. And, um, uh, but every time we tried to diurese her, you know, she could not really diurese very well, and she could not tolerate a second, um, you know, inotrope or, or oppressor. So despite all the augmentation of uh, immunosuppression, she, this is how her heart looked just still not moving much. And uh, then, you know, she started to get more short of breath. She started requiring BiPAP uh, pretty much all the time. And um, this is how our chest X-ray looked, uh, like, you know, congested, pulmonary edema. So um, now, you, you know, you have somebody who is failing on a balloon and an inotrope. And with some degree of uh, hypoxia requiring um, BiPAP support. So I guess, again, uh, to the panel is, you know, what would you do next? Whether, you know, is this the time to do, you know, maybe I'll, I'll add in one more option is, you know, to, a, to do a, we, we know she has biventricular failure. Should we even consider doing, uh, you know, by, by impella or, you know, right and left sided support? Uh, and then just maybe the oxygenation will just get better on its own and or, you know, ECMO. So, so I, you know, I think using the balloon pump's okay, um, as long as you have a strategy of understanding success and stabilization or not measured in order of hours, right, let alone days. So she's actually getting a lot worse. Um, I would want to know the degree of hypoxia. I think ECMO, if you're really w very sick and hypoxic or acidotic is a, is a good strategy. It doesn't sound like she's perhaps there, but that x-ray is very concerning. And I think it, it is true she has biventricular uh, support needs, but this is right-sided heart failure in the setting of left-sided heart failure from your hemodynamics. So I think the easiest next step, based on her being 5-1, is, um, is impeller support. 
And so I'd be thinking of the Impella CP, um, which is a certainly a lower French size than, than Tandem or AV ECMO. And, and I think it is fair uh, to say from the studies, albeit in the setting of PCI or AMI, the Impella CP uh, offers more hemodynamic support than a balloon. And then that's versus considering uh, anticipating needs measured in the order of several days as opposed to hours. Maybe a 5.0, which we know is our most robust form of impella support, but we need the surgical skill set for a graft in the axillary artery. So impella CP versus 5.0, I think would be the next best step. Yeah, I, I agree. The uh, 5.0 would be nice, but of course the issue is, you told me she was five foot one. You do need a seven millimeter ax uh, vessel, usually axillary, to, to place these devices. So if someone who's under 5.4, I start getting concerned that the vessels may be a little too small. Um, but if it's possible, and looking at her vessel, then you could definitely consider a 5.0 if she has some time, but a CP, someone her size would probably put, give a very adequate support. Uh, Dr. Masood, I want uh, yeah. your, your take on ECMO uh, here. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm going to take a step back. So this is a patient who came with one organ failure. It's now going to three organ failure. You would not only have cardiogenic shock, you've got respiratory failure. And you use a BiPAP actually has impact on your intrathoracic pressure and compliance. So if you have weak heart, and you, you are shoving air down the patient on a full lung, is going to go escalate down. And, you, and, that's a, and again, remember what we keep on forgetting is BiPAP is not easy. These are the patients who are thrashing around, who are restless, who's going to fight. So those are a compounding factor. So they as, exacerbate the whole picture. So you've got renal dysfunction. You've got a patient on BiPAP with respiratory failure. You've got cardiogenic shock. And rest assured, they have lines. They are much more susceptible for infection. So in that state, it's a very fast escalation to the impeller. And again, if in this patient, if they're going to deteriorate, they may need, uh, uh, depending on the oxygen level, um, if they don't quickly resolve, they may need CRRT or dialysis urgently. So it's a whole combination of therapy, which will be, and you have to remember when you put on these patients on continuous dialysis, they're not going to be sitting up. Okay, they can't sit up and everything. Why? So, these are the factors we have to be mindful when we put devices in them as to what they can tolerate or they can't tolerate. Because sometimes putting devices, we don't uh, think of some of the downstream of all of the thing, mobility, DVT, and all the stuff. Actually, that's a quick question to the panel. I think, Jerry, you alluded to it very briefly, but Knowing that this is a diffuse process, things like myocarditis, transplant rejection, which includes both RV and LV, hypothetically equally, she has a rest typically these patients have a restrictive pattern. How would you plan on an upfront by V versus a stage LV, then follow the RV support? Uh, that's where the ECMO discussion comes in, right? So, what what are what are this? What's the panel thoughts on? Would you take a chance on the RV and hope it does okay with LV support, or would you just go upfront with IV support? So my uh, my take is that if their biventricular failure associated with severe refractory shock, hypotension, and hypoxia, you need a biventricular upfront platform, namely ECMO. This lady was alert, oriented, yes, in heart failure. A high CVP doesn't equal severe biventricular heart failure, needing upfront ECMO. And many patients, if you unload a left ventricle, can get a lot better. Now, patients can change quickly. And so that's why I was uh, uh, interested in the balloon pump as the path of least resistance in terms of complication. And so now, obviously, she's going into multi-organ failure. I think we have to be very cognizant of that, those comments made by uh, Masood. Um, but I'm still thinking um, left-sided support because, because because I think she still has a fighting chance, and then the, the ECMO challenges are real in terms of placement and complications. And so, yes, it offers the most robust support, but at potentially at the greatest price in terms of risk profile. So, so I'm still very focused in on, on really the CP, and, and, and we, Eddie and I and our team would have what I would qualify as journal club about the pros and cons of going to Impella 5 versus CP. And, and she's sick, right? You'd have to intubate her, anesthesia, cut down. So, so I'm, I'm focusing in on the CP with what I'm seeing as of now. So uh, anyway, you know, she, she ended up getting ECMO. Uh, <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> but Ash, Ash After the, so to walk us through the rationale. So I, I think uh, the rationale here really was the, in that she had biventricular uh, failure with worsening hypoxia and worsening renal function 
uh, with creatinine going up. So the, the thought process there was that if with ECMO you could provide oxygenation and also pro you know, possibly use the ECMO circuit to also you know, uh, ultra filter her, so it would you know, serve more than one purpose in that sense. And uh, we really, at this time, we were thinking with thymoglobulin and with uh, you know, all the steroids she got, if she's not recovered, we will be looking at you know, potentially retransplanting re her. So that Yeah, I was just going to say, I think, it's a good, um, I think it's a good thing, because we historically have been using ECMO, AV ECMO, very late. Like, we've been reserving that form of treatment for those that are in the most overt, overt severe refractory shock or in active, actively coding, right, with uh, recent PEA as a reflection of pump arrest. And in those cases, our survival to discharge has been dismal. There is a um, really, a, not a movement, but a growing experience with earlier use of AV ECMO ash to improve upon likelihoods of success. So I think, I think it's okay to have done that with the idea of the risk profile, but I'm very interested in the discussion of what type of ECMO, peripheral versus central, central to minimize complications with the caveats of wanting her to be sitting upright. Uh, Dr. You know, Hussein and Dr. McGill both yes. have. Uh, so, Ash, one question. I didn't uh, look at the entire echo images, but um, the, the RV was dilated or not? RV was dilated compared to the LV. Okay. You know, LV was small and stiff, like okay. you have in like acute okay. severe rejection, but. Just one comment in terms of augmenting mechanical circulatory support. I think one concept that I want to bring forward, I think we've talked about this before, is um, the intrapericardial restraint and ventricular interdependence. And if someone is not adequately unloading with, say, a balloon pump or an impella, a thing that comes into play, early CRRT and trying to bring down the RA pressure, decongesting the right side can actually improve left-sided hemodynamics. And um, an aggressive strategy of CRT sometimes can help uh, avoid further escalation in mechanical circulatory support. Uh, I just wanted to make that yeah. one comment. Thank you. Dr. McGillivray. Uh, great. And just uh, as Jerry had alluded to before, I mean, the, the thing to keep in mind with ECMO is that it'll pr improve perfusion, but it won't decompress the right and left ventricles. And, yeah. You, you, it's very easy to get wooed into that um, false sense of improvement. No, that's exactly what happened to our patient, where the blood pressure improved, but creatinine was a little bit better, but still short of breath, ne needing intermittent BiPAP. So the, so the next steps, uh, you know, I, I just to, um, I guess, uh, clue you in was the balloon pump was removed and the patient was o only on ECMO. Okay, now, so does that make sense? So, so let me let me qualify my comment with some. Uh, let me qualify my comment with a comment. If if you're going to put someone, I presume peripheral AV ECMO, and you know you're going to have a retrograde challenge to a struggling LV who's already in pulmonary edema by clinical features, and you have a swan, why remove the balloon, which is going to help keep LV EDP at least at a minimum from going up, if not reduce. And, and in fact, I think if you're going, if you're progressing to AV ECMO need on a balloon, you leave the balloon. And, and, and I think that's just a, a sound concept now proven, right, in terms of no, a, no, no, a, Absolutely, a, you know, now, now I think that it's gaining more acceptance. So I'll just segue into the next cu couple of slides and then, because Arvind has another uh, case to talk about, we are already at, you know, uh, midway through. So uh, just to, you know, um, uh, elaborate more into what Jerry was saying, is that this is the PV loop of somebody with cardiogenic shock, where the red one is somebody with cardiogenic shock and the green is somebody who's normal. So the stroke volume, which is the area under this, is really small. And as you can see here, the wedge pressure, or the LVEDP, is high. Uh, but the systolic blood pressure, which is uh, this one, is, I, I guess I'm not, uh, you're not, uh, it is actually low. And I was hoping that it actually comes up here. But, um, is actually low. So then, you know, uh, looking at what happens to patients with, uh, when you put them on ECMO, if you look at this red uh, bold uh, graph here, um, the stroke, you know, the blood pressure definitely goes up, uh, and the native stroke volume is low, but if you look at the LV EDP, it actually increases. So it doesn't really give the LV a chance to actually um, 
uh, relax and, and, and kind of recover. And what it does is because the LVDP is high, you still have pulmonary congestion and you uh, have pulmonary edema. So then with this patient, what we ended up doing is, you know, we added an inotrope back again, we diuresed, which improved the LVEDP a little bit, but it, again, did not bring it down to where we would want it to be. And then, uh, you know, eventually we got the balloon pump back in, which led to, you know, uh, unloading of the LV. And uh, so uh, just to bring about this concept of now, you know, ECMO uh, with balloon pump or or ECMO Pella, whatever, you know, the, the, if you're not getting a adequate um, uh, unloading with the ECMO, then you, you know, put in a, an impeller to completely un unload the LV. Um, so I just wanted to reiterate that this is really important that once you put people on ECMO in, in patients with cardiogenic shock, uh, it does not unload the LV very well. And you really need another, either sometimes with just inotropes and diuresis, you do get uh, you know, adequate unloading. So having a swan in with a VA ECMO circuit is really important to uh, assess the degree of LV unloading. So I think with this, I'm going to uh, ask Arvind to come and... Uh, Ash Wilder and setting up, I will ask a question. Given her, given her size and presumed use of peripheral AV ECMO, were there any mitigation strategies to curb leg ischemic risk? So Did she have an anti-grade sheath? So with with all of our VA ECMOs here, we have an anti-grade sheath, which is placed by vascular surgery, to make sure the peripheral uh, circulations, uh, you know, adequately preserved. So, Ash, what happened? So, yeah. <laughs> She has an ECMO balloon. Yeah, so she, so she, she, you know, she stabilized and then, you know, she got retransplanted within a week, and now she's, she's at home. home. She's at home. <laughs> now I remember the case. Right? <laughs> Thanks, Ash. And and I think as Ash reflected, one of the intricacies of shock is uh, it's not as simplistic as it looks like, and the simple concept which sounds accepted now, there are still centers, and maybe even us, we have general clubs, as Jerry says, at the bedside. Every patient who gets an ECMO, and as Dr. McElroy pointed out, it's very easy to think, oh, we're all taken care because we've perfused the body. But one of the concepts of shock that we need to keep in mind is we've historically focused on the body in shock and forgot about the heart, because we all do pressors, we want to perfuse the kidneys, but the energetics of the heart when you're perfusing with an ECMO and the valve is not opening in, in, in the heart, you're essentially increasing the afterload. That's what the PV loops reflect. So the concepts of shock are much more complex, and, and the goal of this to focus on hemodynamics is to try and spend some time in understanding this so that we can care for these patients better. So I'll jump right into the, in the case, and, uh, and we'll engage the esteemed panel into some comments and this, um, this also reflects that shock comes in different flavors, and, and each one has a very different strategy. So this was a 72-year-old uh, African-American female, had no past medical history, presented with progressively worsening chest discomfort and shortness of breath for a week uh, onset uh, to a, in a community hospital, were hypotensive in the ER, uh, got some fluids, got put on pressors, and anti had an acute anterior MI uh, ST elevation uh, and hence was taken to the cat lab and intervened. And despite that, she was in persistent cardiogenic shock post reperfusion, and hence she got transferred to our center. And there's a verbal report from the transferring cardiologist that the lady was 99% occluded in the mid area. Revascularization was performed, but there was distal perfusion was poor because the vessel was diffusely diseased. So in, in our ICU, once she lands here, she had blood pressure is 91 over 66, heart rate is 110, cold and clammy peripheries, dobutamine of 5, norepi of 10, and then it's escalating by the minute. And her echo shows, well, showed EF of 22% uh, uh, previously. So I think, well, I guess we'll move on to the angiogram and see what Colin, uh, Colin, uh, this, I hope it projects okay. I don't, it's not showing up yeah, on the monitor here. there. The slides. The slides are not showing up on the panel's monitor. Hmm. Um, I don't see glare. Hopefully, Colin doesn't get a neck spasm, but you can you no. can see the films. No, he's <laughs> gonna have to stand up and look. 
So the, the, these are limited pictures, but I think the, that's the LED showing Colin, a stent go. in there, but uh, the distal perfusion. And then there's another LV gram I can play after this, but Colin, any thoughts or? I'm just looking, I mean, this is the only view we have. Yeah, that's the only, only view I'm giving you. Today. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the Prox LED is still a little hazy, but you have, you have, you know, too many three flow. I mean, distally maybe too many two, but it's just, uh, I'm, I'm just not sure about that Prox LED if it's, if it's totally fixed. Okay. And then the LV gram. Uh, let's see, the LV gram. So we have our... No, escape. there's a lot. There's MR. That's what you're seeing. And then the, the EF is like uh, 25, 30%, sort of global. Yeah, so I, I, there's, a, there's a whiff of contrast going in the wrong place. I think that's the first. And MR is a possibility, and I heard Man oh, say... Oh, yeah, there is. The RV is filling, too. Yeah. So, and then this is a, probably another view of the LV gram. Um, so this is what you have to think about, right? Patient post-MI persistent cardiogenic shock is a mechanical complication as suggested, but this was not, this was neither picked up nor reported on, on the patient arrived. So when you go back and look at it, um, so at this stage, so what, what, would, what would you do next? Jerry, what, what, what's your the next? So, so, I mean, yeah, so she's in post-MI <laughs> shock, and in this scenario compared to the last one, you know, I'm less enthusiastic about a balloon pump, and you're you're painting a picture for a VSD as a as a complication, and the proximity to the insult is within days, right, or hours. So it's a fresh one, MI. Correct. One so, one week probably symptoms were lasted about a week before she presented. So you know, the, the, certainly a surgeon needs to be on board, but whether they'd be willing to take her with in this shape now, I think she needs support um, to, to, to curb this vicious downward cycle you're painting in terms of shock. And so in this scenario with a mechanical complication, um, uh, tandem's intriguing. Now the challenge there is her left atrium may not be remodeled like our heart failure patients. And so getting the inflow cannula in with a transeptal puncture and unloading, uh, you're gonna be predisposed to more chatter and indoor preload challenges. Um, that's versus saying, okay, there is a possible VSD, and you can confirm that uh, with echo, um, putting in an impeller device across the valve to unload. And uh, yeah, you can see it there. So, so I, think, I think she needs support, um, and I think she needs surgical consultation, but I think she also needs time to uh, stabilize, mediated by a, a higher level of support. And I, I think I would, you know, her LV is not that big, so the, 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 the impeller is going to be challenging and there is a VSD there. Um, so, so tandem support, although you have the challenges I've mentioned, are, are, are intriguing. I, think, I don't think I'd pers pursue AV ECMO, uh, yeah, but think, one can make a case for that. Uh, before we ask Eddie about the surgical involvement, any uh, thoughts on the echo, any echocardiographers who want to take or call in the size of the VSD or location? <laughs> I'm not an echocardiographer by any means. Um, <laughs> I would defer. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Dr. But, Q, what, but, what are you? But it looks significant. So I never really underst understand the... the um, I mean, I don't have all the images, but... The philosophy of cooling people off and waiting. Um, I mean, for anything. I so, mean, we, so if I can make a couple of comments, I think, you know, this is a VSD. We see the yeah, spectral pattern is typical, the color. But the thing that is important is, um, do you have a dead heart? with a VSD, or do you have a viable heart with a VSD? And right now we're seeing a lot of movement of walls. And I don't care what the EF is. I mean, the EF is a number at this point in time, I think is, is of no significance. It's important is that we see a lot of wall motion, a lot of thickening. And with the limited views you're showing me, we have a viable heart. That happened to be in trouble because of an acute VSD in the presence of an MI, which is a different scenario from having a dead heart you know, with a lot of damage, which on top of which has a VSD. So from the point of view of looking at the patient and potential for salvage, I think this is the kind of patient that you really want to go aggressively because there's a good chance that you can do good. 
Yeah. And sit, like now, you know, the whole cooling down thing. Yeah. So, is, Colin, is a so, Colin, it, so, so I'm with you. I mean, she's 71. She has a good heart in the presence of VSD with a recent MI. So let's hear from our surgeons. I mean, yeah, that's the that's the she needs the fix. Mm -hmm. That's the fix. But let's hear from our surgeons. Yeah, side. just to give you the specifics: uh, liver failure, total release about three, and oh. renal failure, <laughs> creatinine is 2.4. It's not too bad. <laughs> Intubated. <laughs> So to, to, to first address what Colin pointed out, you know, there, there is this old saw that you should wait until the walls stiffen up so it's easier to sew a patch in. And although that is true, and if you wait, the number of patients that will do better at surgery is higher, the number of patients that will get to surgery is very low. So it's a bit of Darwinism that, uh, that most of these patients, particularly the, as you described, won't survive to wait. So the classic teaching is to operate on these patients, you stabilize them with a, with a balloon or some kind of temporary mechanical support, and then in a day or two, go to surgery. Although recently, there's been a number of reports using uh, biventricular mechanical support to support these patients, and their outcomes are better than historically. So an anterior uh, VSD uh, has probably about a 25 or 30 percent mortality rate. Uh, if you have a posterior basal VSD, that's you know probably twice that. Maybe survival rate's probably 30 percent in experienced centers. Yeah, and the nice thing is um, we're, we're talking about like rushing into the OR. I mean, T Billy of 3.0. If you can get their body able to survive a surgery the best shape they can, that's most important, you, you do want to save the heart. But the nice thing is, Impel used to be contraindicated for VSDs because people were worried about the shunting, you know, sucking blood from the right and and uh, and causing desaturation. The nice thing is, there is, like uh, Dr. McGillery noted, an increasing experience with people actually putting in Impellas and, and supporting them quite well and, and uh, getting them, like you said, it may be some Darwinism, but there do seem to be some improved uh, anecdotally, at least right now, improved outcomes if you can get them in a good condition to get through surgery, first of all. So it is now a, a good, a, a, I think, a very legitimate option that needs to be. So, so today, neither of you are taking this patient to surgery. And of course, it's a Friday evening. Yeah. And it was. It was right, actually because, Friday because, evening. Because we're, <laughs> no, but, but I think that's important to highlight because, Colin, yes, that's what we want. No, they're not going to surgery today. You, know, you have a patient in shock. So we have to do something to support her to give that patient a fighting chance. If she goes to surgery today, she probably won't be able Agreed. To Agreed. 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 Yeah. So, so along those lines, we have to make a decision today on what device. Well, I mean, it sounds like a biventricular impella, right? Or, you could or start, a, I would just start with a simple impella, honestly, and, and see how, how that does if... If she has no right heart failure and it's just because of VSD, you can put mm -hmm. it in see if it supports it enough for sure. So I, I think as Jerry pointed out, you know, we have all these discussions and I'm, I don't think any surgeon will or should take the patient in in, in such a shock state. Uh, but I also want to come back to the reason why Ash and I are using this pressure volume loops and just FII is this is a simulation called as Harvey, uh, which is a textbook written by Dan Burkhoff, which is a very good educational tool to make us think about the heart and the body as two independent entities, because looking at the pressure volume loops here, I think before this app, we probably didn't want to think about PV loops because they're kind of nightmares in med school to, to remember. Uh, but the, the certain things that get reflected are important. As Ash pointed out, this is a normal um, pressure volume loop. The pressure volume loop is a single cycle of the volume and pressure at the same time. So this uh, axis is uh, volume and this axis is pressure. And information like MVO2 is oxygen consumption of the heart. Information like cardiac power output are not easily available unless you think about these in this context. So and when a heart is in shock, for, I mean, this lady had an acute MI. It's an acute insult. It's an acute heart failure. Um, you know, before even the VSD is thrown into the picture, she's not able to, I mean, her walls looked okay, but the anterior wall was not well perfused. So you reduce the output of the heart and it becomes a, a, a curve on the other, on, onto this side of the uh, curve. Also, this line represents contractility. 
So this contractility line is much lower, showing that the LV is not contracting well. Now, th if you throw in a VSD, and what's very fascinatingly represented is a VSD is a afterload reduction of the heart. In one essence, the myocardium likes it. And that's where Dr. Q was pointing out, MR and VSD will make the LVEF look better because it's unloading. So if you go purely by the heart, in fact, you'll notice later on when we unload the LV with Impella or any other device, it actually moves towards the left this way. It gets a little more triangular. But in, in here, in one essence, the LV is loving it because it, it's not fighting against the load, but the body is not getting enough perfusion. Correct. It goes to the RV and the preload comes back, but it's an afterload reduction, which uh, as a systemic vascular assistance that goes down. So, and uh, this looks complex, but I also want to spend some time to show that, I mean, this is just, these are ABGs. Don't pay too, I mean, you could pay some attention to that, but if you notice up here, hopefully it's projecting okay. The oxygenation and uh, on the right side, and this is a systemic circulation, this is the LV, RV, RA, and um, LA. So before a shunt, this person has an output of about four, uh, and this is all simulations based on the patient data. And then the pulmonary flow is about four. So just keep an eye here that once we create a shunt, um, you, will, you will notice that the shunt will take away from the cardiac output. So the outputs drop down. The shunt is flowing about five liters, and then now your pulmonary flow has gone up. So this shunting has also increased the oxygenation. So it's a left to right shunting with the oxygenation going to the left. And as Imad was pointing out, the right-sided uh, uh, load also increases. Even though it's a shunt that is pushing into the PA, you'll notice that the right side, uh, the diastolic, uh, the end diastolic pressure has moved. Um, so what what kind of support, as Jerry was pointing, uh, is something which is situations like this can be very tricky in what kind of support you do. Another thing to remember is the natural reaction of these patients in the ER and the ICU is to get put on norepinephrine and things to maintain the pressure. So what happens in this context when you increase the SVR? And then you'll notice here again the same simulation. You have the shunt, and then um, as we put the patient on the norepinephrine and increasing the doses, you'll see the shunt going up. And this is the graph showing that the uh, afterload is being increased. And as you increase the afterload, the shunt gets worse. The worse the shunt gets, the worse the blood pressure to the systemic circulation gets. So in fact, you're making it worse, and over a period of time, you're decre increasing the hypoperfusion to the, to the body. Mm. So, as Jerry had alluded to a little bit, remains hypotensive on increasing dose of epinephrine and norepinephrine. So um, what are the choice of mechanical support? And, and maybe we can start with Colin. So what would you, what's your first choice of mechanical support, Colin? Um, we still can't get a surgeon to take me. <laughs> so the answer, the, the, you have to accept this and move on. No, there's no surgeon that's taken this patient to the OR to get it off your your clock. I, then I would I would go ahead and try by by the impella. By the impella. Mm -hmm. Dr. Masood ECMO or uh, no, it's not right now. I mean, you know, shock liver, I mean you, that's a certain death if you put an ECMO on this patient. They will bleed to death. Well I mean I would go with Dr. Barker. So Eddie by the impella I, I, would, I would start just with a regular left sided impella and titrate it to the peripheral oxygen saturation to try to mitigate the right left shunt if that's not enough. You can go to biventricular support, but I think the left side it may just be sufficient, especially if it's no ischemia to the right side. If it was all a left sided, like LED insult. Jerry. So, given you're not fixing the shunting, I think you need biventricular support. Your options are either uh, uh, impella on the right and on the left, or AV ECMO for both with venting or a SWAN strategy to ensure LVDP doesn't go up. Um, she's 71, and she's probably smaller. And so a peripheral AV ECMO has its challenges. So I'm, I'm agreeing with Colin along those lines. And I see Dr. Neil Kleiman back there taking notes on pressure volume loops. I'd be interested <laughs> to see what he says. Dr. Kleiman, what are your thoughts? Support? Uh, pressure volume loops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably the pressure volume loops we should. 
about yeah, what to do, most importantly. Yeah, the patient, the PV loops, we should reserve for later. Well, you know, look, when I come home late and I'm hungry, I open the fridge and I grab what's at arm's length. <laughs> uh, this is no different. You know, you've got a patient who's got a big hole in their septum, who's pumping from what looks like a reasonably intact LV to the right side rather than to the aorta. The easiest thing to do is to put an impeller in the left side and look at what happens to the patient. If patient improves, great, you're done. Close the fridge. If the patient doesn't improve, uh, then I'd do what Colin said. I'd put in a right side impeller. But uh, I can count on my hand the number of right-sided impeller survivors we have so far. And in fact, if I were wearing a cast and couldn't extend my fingers, the count would be the same. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd go for what's easy in this patient. I'd uh, unload the left side. You know, we always worry about sucking blood from the right side, but you know, we really haven't seen that happen. So, uh, you know, I think basic things are basic. Pull blood out of the left ventricle, eject it into the aorta, the direction it's supposed to be going. I, I, as much as a lot of people might ignore those analogies, I want people to remember the fridge analogy he gave. We'll go back to that. <laughs> we'll go back to that. Can, can I just, I just want to make a quick comment just to highlight something that you said, and, and I just think it's very important that, at, you know, this patient's on increasing dose of, of vasoconstrictors and they're getting worse, and, and it's just that vicious cycle. And I, I just want to highlight that if you don't think about the cardiovascular pathophysiology and the hemodynamics, you're not going to help this patient. So I just think it's, it's a really important point that we just wanted to highlight. Yeah, and I, I think that's key. You know, pressors are, are, are of the past in, in, in the context of cardiogenic shock, and mechanical supports have evolved to a point that if you don't think about it, you won't explore it. Yeah, yes, but sir. having said that, you're still using it while you're waiting to open up the fridge, which is the cath lab. Yes. And that's not readily available. Sure. Yeah. So uh, not on the panel, but I, w I wanted to vote in for it. So <laughs> our, our RA pressure, as long as the RA pressure does not exceed the wedge, I, I agree with Eddie that I, I would just uh, do a left-sided impella to start with rather than go straight to biventricular impella. I just think you guys were waiting too long. You know, we're waiting till people get so sick, and that's why we have zero survivors with a right-sided. I mean, we're putting these in when their liver's shot. They're, you know, yeah, I, I, yeah. this device is, is pretty simple to put in and relatively safe. I think everything we know about shock, the sooner we do something, the better. Waiting till people get sick and then sort of, you know, calling a, an audible seems to always end up with a mortality. I just want to reiterate what I said before to Colin. I said, you know, that uh, when I was in Boston, we had a really big experience with post-infarct VSDs. And looking at Tyrone David's experience as well, that if you take a patient with a post-infarct VSD in this kind of end organ failure to the operating room, you'll close the hole. It's easy enough to fix the hole, but the, the survival will be abysmal. That's why uh, you know, the, the thought, at least surgically, is moving towards stabilizing with whatever kind of mechanical support you need and then fixing the hole. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, all these, the, the, the theme of this is to remember that there's no right answer unless you walk through the options available and figure out what the right answer is. So we talked about balloon pump and ECMO tandem, Impella. I think all these options were thrown out. Maybe ECMO was not um, uh, as an option by the panel, but ECMO, peripheral ECMO is probably one of the easiest to put in at the bedside compared to mobilizing the cath lab and doing a transeptal. So... I'm, with the interest of time, I'm not going to go into too much specifics, but as much as historically balloon pump was considered as an afterload reduction agent, look at here, this is the VSD state. You put in a balloon pump, it's barely changing any. And the balloon pump is an augmenting uh, um, um, agent in the, in the context. You need some cardiac output for you to augment. So when you're shunting everything to the right side, it's probably not the most robust. But again, if you reach into the fridge and that's the only thing available, that's better than pressors. Uh, same thing with ECMO. What's actually interesting in ECMO is if you put the patient on ECMO and you'll notice up here in the shunting that you, you can increase the afterload. If you're not venting the LV like we talked before, 
if you increase the afterload, you're actually increasing the shunt here. The shunt has gone up to about six liters compared to four liters. So ECMO might be lucrative and easy to put it in, and you'll take over the oxygenation, but you are continuing to shunt to the right side. And I don't know how that factors into whether the, you're expecting the tissues to heal up or friability or not. I don't think that's, that's another important uh, concept to remember. So you, I, I hope I didn't misstate. You don't need the tissues, and you shouldn't wait for the tissues to stiffen up. The way that we fix these uh, is to put a big endo exclusion patch on the inside. Uh, so the the condition of the t the even though the VSD can be relatively small, the infarct is usually very big. So you want to line the inside of the ventricle with a patch. So it doesn't really matter what the the tissues look like. Yeah, but I, I think it's, it's actually keen to note that by putting in an ECMO, you're worsening the shunt from left to right because you're increasing the afterload on the left side. Um, now, as we talked about impella and tandem, if you put in an impella um, in this patient, you actually do unload the LV um, and uh, you decrease the shunt. It goes down to about three liters, and if you put in a tandem, um, it actually unloads the LV also, probably about equally, maybe the, uh, the simulation throws in a shunt to get down a little more. Now, what, what we, um, and then I'm gonna skip this, but if you actually do the math, you can see that in the balloon pump, the, the, the VSD shunt um, is, doesn't really move much from 4.9 to 4.5, and then the systemic perfusion is actually quite low. And Impella 5 and Tandem are probably similar. Now the QPQS becomes a little tricky because the, the systemic flow is, if you do the cardiac flow, then it's gonna be very high. But if you add the VAD flow, uh, it kind of becomes irrelevant at this stage for us to talk about. So what we ended up doing was the Tandem, and the rationale was that with the LV that you saw, it's still a thicker um, anterior wall, and it was hyperdynamic to some extent with the VSD that's unloading. Putting in an impella into an outflow track, you know, can be wrought with issues in the context of positioning, um, and and with that reasoning, we ended up doing a tandem heart. And, and tandem heart is where you go transeptal into the left atrium for those who don't uh, typically deal with it. So you're not in the LV, but you're still unloading the LV indirectly by sucking out the blood from the left atrium and pumping systemically. Um, it is a big French catheter, like uh, Jerry uh, pointed out, so we did end up doing a distal perfusion uh, catheter to maintain the flow, because you can port off the tandem, uh, uh, you know, in an essence, so that you're perfusing the distal flow of the, of the patient. Um, and another concept that Ash alluded to actually plays with tandem too. So it, this was this gentleman who had, or this lady who, when once after we put in a tandem, because you're unloading from the left atrium, there's not much blood coming out of the um, uh, aorta. So had no pulsatility on the aorta, had a perfusion pressure of 84, just like a continuous flow pump. Um, and then we added mildenone to promote some amount of pulsatility because you want the aortic valve to open to an extent. And, and that to an, ex to an extent is what Ash talked about when you have an ECMO, when you don't let the aortic valve open. And, and this is an example actually of an ECMO patient. You'd notice that this was a patient who came over to us from a, had an ECMO in, the, in another institution. But when you take her to the OR, look at all the um, smoke here. The attic valve is not opening as much, so you're not washing the LV. And then you put this patient, actually this was on Mildenone, just by increasing the contractility, we were able to open up and clear everything. Of course, this, this gentleman ended up having a devastating stroke by the fact that you're promoting clots. So these are hemodynamic concepts which are extremely important to know and tailor for each patient. And I'm not gonna go into the aspects of VSD repair. There was a good discussion. Uh, what we'll, we'll wrap up just talking a little bit about what, what we need to do for shock. But it's key to recognize that maybe we've not been doing that as, a good as much as a good job in mechanical support of the VSD patients to get them to a point that they're better surgical candidates, and that's a strategy to promote. Um, but wrapping up about cardiogenic shock, and Ash mentioned briefly, but the outcomes for cardiogenic shock are still dismal. 
and most data comes from STEMI population. If you look at non-STEMI population, data is limited, and there's not many registries that have looked into it, but you're still hanging out around 40, uh, 40 you know, about 30, 35%. This is STEMI data. This is ICU data from Europe, which is still about 50% 50, uh, 50, uh, mortality. That's very high. Now, myocardial uh, infarction and shock has had a lot of impetus and, and, and focus in, uh, in trying to improve outcomes. The pathophysiology just suggests that it's a slippery slope, and as I suggested, the body is in shock. At the same time, you have to remember the heart is in shock, so you want to protect both with the strategies that we talked about. Essentially, it's a sinking ship. And, and I was taught very early in my internship saying the moment you perceive a sinking ship, make your phone calls and pull everybody in so that you're not alone. And the, 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 the ship can be various kinds of sinking, right? This one is obvious. It's sinking. This is water's coming in gradually. This is not obvious. It's going gonna, it's gonna to sink at some point. So being able to recognize that. So what are the issues in shock care right now? Recognizing that the patient is in cardiogenic shock. I mean, you have this cartoon where this guy's sitting up there, I'm 200 feet high in the air, why am I sinking? Uh, but you are going down. Recognizing that a patient is cardiogenic shock is itself a challenge. We have a blood pressure definition, and Ash pointed out hypoperfusion is important. Having a plan to monitor the slippery slope, as Jerry was pointing out, you can't do something and wait two days or three days for it. And controversies of what to follow, you know, swan gans catheter or no swan gans catheter. I'm sure if I put Dr. Kleiman, myself, and Neil, I mean, and uh, Colin. But let's make it easy. We'll, Every shock patient needs a swan. Correct. And no, see, I, keep moving on. Don't, no, Dr. Kleiman's raising his hand. He wants to challenge it still. <laughs> but every shock patient, true shock, needs Correct. a swan. Correct. Every cardiogenic. Swan should never be used for human beings. <laughs> <laughs> so, nor, and, and in most cases, nor should an arterial line, uh, because, you know, as I think Arvind has pointed out, between the lines, we're so conditioned to treat every patient according to a single algorithm with the same drugs, whether they help or hurt, uh, these things make us do really stupid things, myself included. I mean excluded. <laughs> yes, yeah, swan gans catheters have been under bad reputation, but you have to know the evidence behind it. And I think it's, if, you, if you have the information, it's like saying if you do arterial lines, people are going to die if you don't act to the arterial lines. So it's how you process the information and how you act on it. And it's important to get the information so that you act on it appropriately. So the Swan-Gans catheter data are really great. And in fact, if you have a statistic, is Moritz here? So the first clinical use of the propensity score was in Connor's study of Swan-Gans catheter. Increased mortality. So Nick, I think next grand rounds we'll have a debate. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. But to wrap up quickly, it's important to recognize that the new algorithm that Ash pointed out is a strategy. It's not just, I, I, fix, the, I fix the lesion, the guy is in shock, I'll wait for him to recover. Anticipating recovery, anticipating non-recovery, so you have a plan to then getting them to durable VADs or transplant or some destination, I think these are things to keep in mind. Um, and there are various kinds of supports. The biggest thing that, and to be honest, what we probably need to do some work as an institution is a team approach for shock. We have a team approach. We kind of do those things in, you know, in case scenarios, but having a shock protocol and in, involving systematically an ICU intensivist, cath lab, cardiothoracic surgery, and advanced heart failure in every patient who's in cardiogenic shock is something that is necessary. And this is the algorithm that is recommended right now by the AHA guideline on systematizing this, not just in the institution, but across, the, uh, across hospital centers. Detroit Cardiogenic Shock Initiative has been one of the biggest success stories in the recent past, where they have a protocolized algorithm and, and essentially have shown quite good data on improvement, and it's all STEMI patients. Right? Their survival has improved about 80%. Um, what kind of device you use is, is different. That, that's, the whole study was based on using unloading with Impella. Um, but within, within a hospital, the areas to remember are the cath lab has a different kind of a shock, ICUs have a different kind of a shock for logistics, and then the surgical um, shock in the OR is also different, how you strategize it. So 
for us to create systems, and the analogy of the refrigerator is very important, is no matter how much we debate what we want to use, in the middle of the night at, 11, at, at 1 o'clock, if someone's crashing, the easiest thing for me to do is a bedside balloon pump. That doesn't mean that I do it and walk away. Um, I still have to figure out what's the next step and mobilize the cat lab. So availability is important. This is a proposal, and we're probably we're working on it as an institution. This is actually going to be a proposal that I did pretty much yesterday that we, <laughs> you know, it, it, <laughs> that, that's a proposal that we will be working on really to have a cardiogenic shock protocol and team. You know, Dr. Kleiman, Dr. Barker, they're all, you know, Suarez, we've had discussions. But essentially, you want to target into a shock team um, here with the heart failure cardiologist, interventional MCS uh, interventionalist, because you need to be able to put in the mechanical circulatory support and not, uh, not, not an interventionalist just uh, doing uh, PCIs and other procedures. And then, of course, ICU is integral to it, creating some metrics. And beyond that, I think as a system, we need to have protocols which actually are able to manage people across the systems as a shock initiative. Because if someone's crashing in West Houston, it's not easy just to transport them within 10 minutes. So you got to know how to standardize care. Uh, you know, Nadia is you know, looking at me, and it's, it's real. Because if someone's crashing over there, how do you standardize? How do you optimize before we transfer them over here? So this is all more to come, but our goal and hope is to promote discussions of shock, and it's under the realm of heart failure. It's a multidisciplinary approach. In the past, shock was all about cath lab and intervention, and I think that's not the only area. It's an interdisciplinary approach under the realm of heart failure, in, which includes a lot of the specialists up there. Thank you. <laughs>